In this video, we're going to start talking about the soundness theorem. Um, and the soundness theorem is a really important meta-theoretic result in logic. Um, in this video in particular, I'm going to set up some preliminaries, and in the next video, we'll actually dive deep into the proof for the soundness theorem itself. But here's the plan for this video. Um, I'm going to start out by talking a bit about what the point of the soundness theorem is and why we should care about this conclusion. Second, I'll give a big picture of the proof for the soundness theorem, um, so talking a bit about um, the methodology that we're using in order to establish the soundness theorem. And finally, I'm going to go over some terminology and useful facts that you need to know in order to do the proof for the soundness theorem. Um, so definitely the most important section of the video uh, concerns the terminology and useful facts. Those are things you're definitely going to need to know in order to um, do the proof later on. Okay, so let's start out by talking about what the point of the soundness theorem is. So we've talked about two ways that an argument can be good in this class. One of them involved using truth tables. So remember when we were talking about truth tables, we would say things like a set of sentences gamma truth functionally entails a set of, um, sorry, a sentence S if and only if there is no truth value assignment that makes all the members of gamma true and S false. Right, so the idea of interest here is truth functional entailment. Another way we can say this is, um, let's say that uh, gamma is a set of the premises of an argument, and S is the conclusion of the argument. So if the premises truth functionally entail the conclusion, so it's not possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false, then the argument is valid. Okay, so that's those are... Um, it's two different words, right? Truth, functional entailment, and validity. Um, two words, but sort of the same concept um, of a good argument that we fleshed out using truth tables. Later on in the course, we started talking about derivations. And there we started exploring another way that arguments could be good. So if a sentence S is derivable from a set of sentences gamma in SD, then um, that's another way that an argument can be good, right? So if some conclusion is derivable from um, a set of premises using the rules of SD, that's another way that um, an argument can be good. So we have these two different notions of how an argument can be good, validity on one hand and derivability on another. At face value, it's not really clear the ways that they overlap and interact. So one question we might ask is, how are these two meanings of a good argument connected? Again, at face value, it's not clear that they are connected at all. But the two meta-theoretic results that we're interested in primarily in the meta-theory unit are the soundness theorem and the completeness theorem, which together establish a very tight connection between these two notions of a good argument. Specifically, the soundness theorem which we're talking about in this video, shows that if, or sorry, conjectures that if um, you can derive a sentence S of SL in SD from a set of sentences gamma, then gamma truth functionally entails S. And the completeness theorem which we'll do in a future video, says that if gamma truth functionally entails S, then S is derivable in gamma. So these two claims together establish a very tight connection between these two ways of saying that an argument is good. And that's a very significant meta-theoretic uh, result. Now that we have a clear idea of why it is we're interested in the soundness theorem, I'm just going to give um, a big picture overview of the kind of reasoning that we're deploying in the proof of the soundness theorem. So the soundness theorem says that if a sentence S is derivable in SD from a set of sentences gamma, then gamma truth functionally entails S. To uh, get a sense of what exactly um, we're going to do when we do the proof of this theorem, it's good to step back and think about what it would mean for this statement to be false. 
this is a conditional statement. And from what we know of the material conditional, conditional statements are false if, the, um, if and only if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So if this claim were to be false, that would mean there would have to be um, a sentence S derivable in SD from a set of sentences gamma, yet it not be the case that gamma truth functionally entails S. Okay, so this is what would have to be the case if the soundness theorem were false. Now let's uh, hash out a little bit in a little bit more detail what exactly this means. We'll start with this claim that S is derivable from a set of sentences gamma in SD. So gamma is going to be a set of sentences. Let's specify that as um, the set of sentences P1, P2, uh, all the way up to Pn. Okay, so the thought is, is that if we were to write it out as a derivation, then we would have the set of sentences up here as premises. And from that set of sentences, we would be able to derive S. Okay, so that's what this first statement is telling us. Now let's turn to the second statement, that gamma does not truth functionally entail S. So uh, what that means is that there must be at least one truth value assignment that makes all the members of gamma true and S false. Let's call that truth value assignment W. Okay, so W is um, an assignment that makes all the members of gamma true and s false. Okay, now let's apply that truth assignment to this derivation. So all of the w um, makes all the members of gamma true. So p1 is true by w, p2 is true by w, and pn is true by w. But w makes s false. So we'll put as here um, as false by w. So here's the main thought is that if s is assigned false by w that means that at some point here in the derivation we must have gotten a sentence a first line that is false by w. Right? And that's because if we end up with something that's false, there must be a first line at which f appears. So here's the thing, though. Here's how we're going to go about doing the proof, is that we're going to prove that there can be no first line that gets marked f by the truth value assignment. Okay, And that's going to be sufficient to prove that this scenario... Right? This scenario in which we have a sentence S derivable from a set of sentences gamma, but where gamma does not truth functionally entail S, that scenario can never happen because there can never be a first line that gets assigned F if we are um, applying only the 11 rules of SD. So that's why the proof for the soundness theorem involves 11 cases. We have to go through 11 cases where this line is justified by each of the 11 rules and prove that we can never get to a line, um, no matter what use we're using to, uh, what rule we're using to justify it, that gets marked F. I know that it feels like I've been jumping back and forth between a lot of topics. There's just kind of a lot of groundwork we need to lay before we start tackling the soundness theorem. Um, proof. So now let's move on to section three, uh, in which we introduce some terminology that we'll need in order to do the proof. So here are the two main things we need to know. Let's say that SJ um, is the sentence in the derivation at line J. And let's say that gamma J is the set of assumptions available at line J. These concepts um, will get a lot more clear when we look at an example. Um, so here's the derivation um, in SD. Uh, this is a derivation that involves disjunction elimination. Um, so over here, I've written um, a couple of things that I want us to identify in this derivation. So the first one 
um, asks us to identify S2. So, right, we look up at our definition here of SJ. So what this is asking us is to look at line two, which has miraculously been erased. Let me put that back in. Okay, so we look at line two and identify the sentence at line two. So in this case, it's A if and only if C. Now let's look at question two. S4. So we look at S4 over here as line four. We see that the sentence there is A. So S4 is A. Okay, so that's exactly how you identify the sentence at any given line. Um, you just look at the number in the subscript, find the corresponding line, and that's the sentence. Okay, now let's look at question three. So uh, now gamma five is the set of assumptions available at line five. So we look at line five here, right? Line five is the C in the subderivation. And now we want to make a set of all the assumptions available at that line. So there are four assumptions. We have the four assumptions, up, sorry, the three assumptions up here, right? So A or B, A if and only if C, and if B, then C, those are all assumptions that we could use at line five if we wanted to. And another one that's available to us is A, right? So that's, uh, those are all sort of within the scope um, of things that we can use at line five. Okay, so that's gamma five, right? We have four assumptions there. Now let's look at um, the fourth question, which asks us to identify gamma seven. So again, we're going to have a set of assumptions that are available to us this time at line seven, which is the C here. So again, there are going to be four assumptions available to us at line seven. And there's a, those are going to be the first three up here. So I'm gonna write them out again, A or B, A if and only if C, and if B then C. And we have B, which is an assumption available at line seven. This A, is an assumption in the derivation, but it's not an assumption, not an assumption available at line seven. And that's because this is a discharged assumption, right? Once the scope line ends here, we can no longer use the A later on in the derivation. Okay, so there are only four um, assumptions available at line seven, and A is not one of them. Whoops. Okay, so now final question is um, identify all the uh, assumptions available at line J. Sorry, at line eight. So line eight is here. What are the assumptions available here? Well, again, we have the first three here, right? A or B, A if and only if C, and if B then C. And actually that's it. Right, so there are two other assumptions in the derivation. We have this one and this one. But both of those, by the time we get to line eight, are discharged assumptions, right? They're no longer assumptions we can borrow from or that are available to use at line eight. So there are only three assumptions available at line eight, and there are four available at each of five and seven.